influential members of the international community prefer statistical over change, fearing that fundamentalist regimes might take <coughs> over. Consequently, they prefer to have friendly but undemocratic regimes in power, and this was abused by the political elites for their own survival. But in 2001, the winds of change had finally reached and started to engulf the entire region with homegrown dynamics. Led by youth, people on the street organized mass movements in search of better living conditions and greater employment of fundamental rights and freedom. For them, it was a call for destiny, for a life in dignity. Thus, we think the region is now finally catching up with the natural course of history. <coughs> in fact, the dynamics of change in the region are reminiscent of the 1848 revolutions and the 1989 events of Europe. I think this resemblance puts a unique duty on the shoulders of the West. In essence, democracy is about institutions, not about religion or ethnicity. And every experience in institution building can be valuable. It is now high time for the West to erase the bitter memories of the past and offer sincere and substantial assistance to the countries in transition. In this endeavor, however, the West should not be driven by narrow calculations of self-interest. Nobody should impose their own rights and wrongs. On our part, Turkey has adopted from the outset a principled approach based on universal values. Having unique historical, social, and geographical bonds with the region, we take our rightful place on the side of the peoples of the region. We stand ready to share our experience in democratization and institution building. Actually, we have already taken some steps in this direction with the new and prospective leaders of Tunisia, Egypt, and Libya. My and Prime Minister Erdogan's recent visits to these countries have clearly shown the affection towards Turkey in the hearts and minds of the people. It is obvious that Turkey is seen as a source of inspiration by the people in the region. The people of the Middle East rightfully deserve a <coughs> dignified life and the dividends of democracy and peace. In fact, our well-established policies vis-a-vis -vis the Middle East have been delivered by this incentive. Turkey is sincerely supporting democratic transformation of the region in order to benefit <coughs> from the dividends of peace. We believe that Democracy is the ultimate guarantor of security and stability. We would like to see true climate of peace in the region, which in turn leads to prosperity. Distinguished participants, certainly democratic transformation will be neither swift nor uniform. Everyone agrees that political reforms shall be accompanied by economic and institutional rights. But Yet, there is no successful political program fully elaborated and tested as to its ability to bring about real change. Therefore, although there is no doubt about the irreversibility of the process of change, it is not certain whether the legitimate aspirations of those who ignited the walls will be accommodated in a quick and sustainable <coughs> manner. The question mark emanates from the following set of risks. One of the concerns arises from the attempts by certain circles who see fomenting sectarian, ethnic, or ideological strife across the region to hijack the process. In this regard, I observe a similar threat in the region based on a Sunni Shia divide. This dangerous proce process 
which will waste the energy and the resources of the region must be prevented. I would like to call upon all governments and organizations not to fall into the trap of <laughs> such a primitive divide in the Muslim world. It poses the greatest threat to the prospects of the Arab Spring and has the potential to move the Muslim world from the 21st century back into the darkness of the Middle Ages. Another risk is about the remnants of the old regime trying to stick to power and slowly kill the spirit of revolution. So we should work hard to show the people that their legitimate aspirations are to be materialized in a reasonable time frame. A viable democracy goes hand in hand with fast economic development and effective capacity building. Nevertheless, the existing socio-economic problems of the region, which inevitably got worse <coughs> in these initial stages of the post-revolution, are another source of worry. Failure in restoring economic order may eventually lead to chaos and turn the, fields, turn the tides against the democratic transition in the region. That's why I have been urging the global financial institutions such as the World Bank and the IMS and major developed countries to launch a comprehensive economic restoration program to support the political transition in the Middle East. This support will particularly be crucial in Egypt and Tunisia. In a nutshell, we have to be extremely careful and vigilant against those challenges and accountable, transparent, and participatory democracy is the only viable response to overcome such dangers. The formation of healthy, functioning oppositions with a broad political base is crucial in terms of success of this transformation process. Democracies cannot survive without pluralism. Pluralism cannot be achieved without effective opposition. Those who unleash the power of the street now need to organize themselves into functioning political parties and develop programs and should refrain from rhetoric and ideological fixations. They need to shift from starting to change to institutionalizing it, the maintenance of public support for the revolution's objectives and actually achieving them will depend on this. Furthermore, we should all keep in mind that the creation of an atmosphere of dialogue and consensus in the region is compensatory for a successful transition. The forces of the revolution should not make the same mistake of their former leaders in trying to monopolize the power and exclude all those who think differently. Democracy is not the rule of majority or the powerful. On the contrary, it requires leadership with humility and responsibility. Tunisia is the first country being tested on this account, and they have so far given us hope for the future. Distinguished participants, I regret to say that our neighbor Syria, in which we have politically and diplomatically invested immensely in recent years has failed in correctly analyzing the development in the region. As Turkey, we always believe in the merits of engagement policy with Syria. In fact, the people of Syria has greatly benefited from the engagement for the past 10 years. On the other hand, our track record is very well known when it comes to resisting the foreign pressure to change this policy. But this time, we cannot remain indifferent to the demands and pressure coming from the people of Syria. Therefore, we exert, exert enormous efforts in public and behind closed doors in order to convince the Syrian leadership to lead the democratic transition. 
Despite all this, the Ba'ath regime continues to use operational violence on its own people. Violence creates violence. Now, unfortunately, Syria has come to a point of no return. The fate of Syria is also important for the entire region, since the country sits on top of sectarian fault line. Defining this democratic struggle along the sectarian, religious, and ethnic lines will drive the whole region into turmoil and bloodshed. In fact, not only for Syria, but for the entire region, <coughs> we have a responsibility to defend the territorial integrity and political unity of the countries at all costs. New and all divisions between and within the countries of the region should not be allowed to take root. In it runs contrary to human nature to support the dictatorship. However, if the alternative was to be chaos, they would not hesitate to live in order under the authoritarian regime. Therefore, the opposition in Syria must embrace all sectarian, ethnic, and religious minorities. They must assure all segments of the society that the new administration will not resort to revanchist or discriminatory practices after the collapse of the Ba'ath regime. When this is truly believed by the people of Syria, the job will be off. Likewise, in Libya, the Transition Council must make sure that the new government is the government of all without an exception. Only through such reconciliatory messages and measures can through democracy prevail in those countries and set an example for all aspiring nations in the region and beyond. On the other hand, the Western countries must have realistic expectation about the nature of the Arab Spring. One should not expect this minister likewise. Democracy agendas. These homegrown movements will certainly at attach particular importance to their own values and traditions. Therefore, imposing one size fits all recipes on these societies is bound to fail. It would be much better if the new political movements can build their own democratic institutions in harmony with their traditions and universal values. Distinguished participants. All these becomes ever more important given the potential global ramifications of a successful transition in the Middle East. Even at this initial stage, I think the Arab Spring had its first global effect by encouraging the people all over the world. In fact, the wall of fear has fallen, not only in the region, but also across the world. In this regard, the world with protest already spread in different corners of the world to express resentments to economic and social injustice are the case in point. They were certainly inspired by the heroic acts of Arab people who bravely took this place against the dictatorship. <laughs> of course, this historic episode of democratization will inspire other peoples who seek accountable governments in other parts of the world. Indeed, a careful analysis of this effect indicates that instead society equilibrium of governance structures, the pointer is shifting from state towards society. As such, people and individuals have moved back to the center of politics. In other words, the transition from society serving to state to state serving to society is being accelerated. That naturally implies that the state is sustainable only if it takes away from its people. With citizens becoming the main pillar and driver, the driver of politics, I hope and believe that there will be more space for freedoms all over the world. 
to understand the real impact of the region's tra 